Good, so it's lovely to have you in the house of God today. Uh, we are missing one or two people and we pray for them we, because they are part of us and we just miss them when they're not here, to be quite frank. Uh, let me start by, by reading a scripture to you. This is from Psalm 29. I was reading this just before the service started. Uh, it's a psalm of David and he starts the psalm by saying, Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name and worship the Lord in the splendour of his holiness. And I got to thinking, well, that's a great shame because it seems to be referring to the heavenly beings, which we're not whilst we're on this earth. Uh, and, and God's holiness is in comparison to our sinfulness and our, our weakness and sometimes our unwillingness to worship him. And I began to, I started by being blessed by that verse and then I began to feel a little bit despondent thinking, well, we know we're not the heavenly beings that are mentioned there. And then I read down and I found this verse uh, towards the end of it. This is just the end part of verse 9. And his temple all cry glory. And in his temple all cry glory. So that worship is for us. It is for us to ascribe to him the greatness that is due to his name. It is for us to lay aside our sinfulness in respect to his holiness, our weakness in respect to his powerfulness. And that's what we're going to do as we worship him this morning. Praise his name. He's indescribable.
brilliant. A couple of great songs we've dusted off this morning. We haven't sung those for a little while. Uh, but it's been great to do that. A mighty fortress is our God, the ins- indescribable one that we spoke of at the beginning, the one whose beauty makes it worthy, makes him worthy of us worshipping him. Those of us in the temple, brilliant, absolutely beautiful. Now we're going to come to uh, communion in a little while. We've got a couple of songs to sing uh, first before we take the communion. So maybe if you're watching this online, you want to get your bread and wine sorted out, ready for uh, when we do that. If you want to join in with us, that'd be great. But let me just read you what the Apostle Paul uh, wrote to the church at Corinth about the Last Supper as it was, communion as we now have it. The Apostle Paul wasn't there, of course, at the time. He hadn't been converted by that time. So this is him reflecting on what he understands beautifully of that Last Supper that Jesus led. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I I think there are many fantastic elements to that brief reading, but among them is that we have that declaration that it is remembrance, but it is also looking forward. It is in remembrance of the sacrifice that the Lord Jesus made, but it is looking forward to the Lord coming again as well. And in the middle of that, we have this declaration that this is the new covenant, the start of something else. All of that procured by his death on the cross. And all of that achieved by the love that he had for everybody and has for us even today. My Lord, what love is this?
only by grace. How else could we come into the presence of God around this communion table but by that grace in which we stand? We started the service by reflecting on how um, his holiness compares to our sinfulness and how our sinfulness is not worthy to be or makes us not worthy to be in his presence but we have been cleansed by the blood of the lamb he has refused to mark our transgressions he has made us into the people that we are and we now stand in him so I wonder if you would take a few moments to express your personal thanks to God before we come around the uh, communion table as I've mentioned before many times this part will not be included in the video so feel free to speak up and shout up and praise God as you will it goes no further than these four walls but it does go into the heavenlies and so Heavenly Father we wrap up our thanks to you Lord, by just putting ourselves in that place. Maybe at the Last Supper. Receiving the bread and the wine from you without understanding what on earth it was going to be about because the crucifixion and resurrection hadn't happened. 
maybe after the resurrection because now we realize why your body was broken and how your blood was shed and we know that it's for us our transgressions have been washed away by the blood of the lamb our sinfulness given to you has expired and exists no longer as long as we face your holiness Lord and place ourselves in your hands so we thank you for these emblems the broken bread the shed blood and we praise your name for your sacrifice for us so Jesus in the presence of those disciples the ones who would stick with him the ones who ran away even the one who betrayed him he took the bread and he broke it and said this is my body do this in remembrance of me in the presence of those same disciples and indeed for those same disciples and for us he took the cup and said this is my blood which is shed for you this is the new covenant it all starts again with the shedding of his blood in Jesus name Praise him, praise him, praise him. Praise him. And so we wrap this time of communion up, Father, with another thank you for giving us two very simple emblems with which to remember the broken body is a piece of bread and the shed blood. It's a glass of fruit juice, but it reminds us so much of exactly how this sacrifice of Christ has made us whole. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God, we're going to take a little bit of a look into the Old Testament. The very old of the Old Testament uh, at the mo this moment in time. Right back to uh, the book of Deuteronomy. This is part way through the journey to the Promised Land. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son so the Lord your God disciplines you. Ouch. Observe the commands of the Lord your God walking in obedience to him and revering him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land a land with brooks and streams and deep springs gushing out into the valleys and hills a land with wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates and olive oil and honey a land where bread will not be scarce and you will lack nothing a land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills now, I, I've got a, a real fondness for uh, the, uh, the, the story that we have of the Exodus and, and the, the move towards the Promised Land. There are many lessons for us to learn. Some of the scriptures don't apply to us anymore. I'm careful saying that because that was the era where the um, sacrifices were introduced for the, um, for the, the, the um, Israelites to follow, for their sins to be removed. And we don't have to do that anymore. As we've explained and seen with the, um, with the breaking of the bread and the, and the shedding of, of Christ's blood, that sacrifice system stopped. But the principles of the, uh, the, the move from the uh, captivity in Egypt into the freedom of the Promised Land are very much ours for this day because we are moving. We are moving from the captivity of sin into the Promised Land of heaven, which we will inherit when we finally trip this mortal coil or when the Lord comes again 
and we will see him face to face. In the meantime, we need to behave ourselves as believers. We need to know that as a father disciplines his son, sometimes the Lord disciplines us. But the remedy for that is to observe the commands of the Lord and walk in obedience and revering him. Now, my prime verse for this morning, our key verse, is chapter um, 7, sorry, chapter 8, verse 7. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with brooks and streams and deep springs gushing out into the valleys and the hills. I love these promises of God. I, I, I actually also very much enjoy how the scripture is often very, very excited in its descriptions. We get a lot of hyperbole in the scripture, whether it's here in Deuteronomy, you try checking out Ephesians 1, the Apostle Paul is talking about the richness of God's love. Uh, you find that God does not skint on the words that he uses to describe the blessings that are available to us because he never skints on the blessings that he gives to us. Now this part of the promise was made to his people on their way to the promised land and whenever God takes us forward, whenever he takes us forward, it is always to improve things for us, even if it may not seem like that at the time. And you may remember if you've read the story or if you've seen any of the films about the, the Exodus, you will know that there were plenty of people who were prepared to do the complaining. We'll talk about this a bit more in a minute. But we are to always look forward. When God takes us forward, it's always to a better place than we were in. Even if at times it does not feel or seem like that. Our perception of what God is doing, or sometimes what he is not doing, is often based on our myopic view of life, with emphasis on the myopic. We only see what is in front of us. We only see the thing that we want to see. But by faith, we need to see that it is always God's intention to bless and to provide for his people on whatever journey they are on. And he actually will do that, eventually, if not immediately. He is, he is there in this in particular verse that we're looking at. He's speaking to the children of Israel and he is telling them what is going to happen. He is telling them that he's going to bring them into a good land. He is telling them and telling us that streams and pools of water will burst forth. They were in a parched desert at the time. That must have felt like an, an imaginary romantic notion that God would do that. That he would take us to springs of flowing water and he would take them and us to rivers that he has created to refresh us. Now we are a month into 2024 now. We have finally got rid of January. January the 78th passed by a couple of days ago and we're now on the 3rd of February, 4th of February. I'm looking at I'm a day out even now. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure that God is going to do great things in this church in, the, in this year. I absolutely believe he is. I mentioned last year that I believe we're going into a season of blessing, new blessings in him. And I stand by that. I'm sure, uh, if you remember back to the story of Elijah, his servant looked out after the land had been parched for so long and he saw a hand, a cloud the size of a man's hand. It wasn't filling the sky with cloud. But because of that tiny hand, cloud, Elijah knew that the, the rains of blessing were going to come on the land at that moment in time. I'd still like to know whether the cloud itself was the size of a man's hand or whether by holding a man's hand up you could, you could cover the cloud. I don't know. But either way, the blessing of God was about to pour down on them even though there was little evidence of it at that time. And I believe that's the key with us right now. We are entering as a church into a season of new blessing. I'm absolutely sure of that. But we, like the Israelites, don't always get it, do we? We don't always get it. Especially in our own lives, when things don't seem to be going so well as they ought to be. 
we sometimes fail to see what God is doing ahead of us. We're looking very much down at where we are right now rather than looking forward. A couple of days ago I wished I'd spent less time looking forward and a bit more looking down because I managed to trip over a drain on the footpath uh, down the road. I passed it hundreds of times. Stepped over it without problem for over the last, I don't know, 20 years. Once a week and after the last eight years, almost every day of the week. But somehow the other day I tripped over it. We need to be careful what we're looking at. We need to be careful where we're looking. So that we see the blessing of God and go and get tripped over on what is around us immediately. And I realise I've mixed my metaphors there a little bit. I hope you will forgive me for that. But in our key verse we have a picture of God taking his people towards the promised land. In that desert he gave them abundant water. Even though all they could see was desert at the time. And that could be the same for our desert, your desert, my desert, the church's desert as well. If we by faith seek God, we will receive God's living waters. In the desert he brought his people streams out of a rocky crag, as Psalm 78, 16 puts it. Now, if your life seems to be a touch rocky at the moment, God is ready and willing to bring streams of living water to your rocky life. Now, this is, this is just the providence of God. This is Jehovah Jireh. This is God providing for us at every which way of our lives. This is God making sure that we have what we need in the spiritual realm, even if we don't always perceive it to be the case. In the helplessness felt by God's people, then he made water to flow down like rivers. And I do love the fact that God does not give stingily. I do love the fact that God, when he wants his people to be uh, given water doesn't pass you down the little syringe by which you can just about make your mouth dry or wet when it's dry I'm also glad that he doesn't just give us a glass full although that's what I need now but he gives us rivers of living water rivers are fantastic things aren't they they don't all get to be um, famous like the river Thames or the Severn or something like that Near us, we've got the River Itchin and we've got the River Test. They're not very big, but they are fundamental to the, uh, to the geography of the land around us here. And they help us in no uncertain terms. In your times of need, the refreshing, life-giving rivers of God are always available to us. The blessing of God is always available to us. He never holds that back. We may be unwilling to receive it, or we may not see it, we may not perceive it. But God is always willing to bless us. Wouldn't you be rejoicing if God always did that for you in the hardest of circumstances? Yeah. Well, rejoice, because he always does. But it doesn't always seem that way, and sometimes the myopia sets in with us as it does did with the children of Israel, and they could see nothing beyond their immediate circumstances. We should be uh, somewhat chastised by the writings of King David in Psalm 78. This is verses 16 to 22. I mentioned uh, this a moment ago that God brought streams out of a rocky crag and made water flow down like rivers. But they continued to sin against him, rebelling in the wilderness against the Most High. They willfully put God to the test by demanding food they craved. They spoke against God. They said, can God really spread a table in the wilderness? True, he struck the rock and water gushed out. Streams flowed abundantly. But can he also give us bread? Can he supply meat for his people? When the Lord heard them, he was furious. His fire broke out against Jacob, and with his wrath, and his wrath rose against Israel, for they did not believe in God or trust in his 
deliverance. Now, I, I, I think we should be chastened by that because I, I don't know about you, maybe I'm making a judgment on everybody else for what is my problem, but I see myself reflected in this. I see myself reflected in the idea that I say, yes, God, surely God has brought blessing into my life and he's done this and he's done that. And then I find myself saying with no faith whatsoever, but can he really do this? Am, am I the only one? Oh yes, God, I know you've done this and I, you know, I thank you for what you've done and you've, you, you've made th this sort of thing happen and you've brought this into my life. But can you really do the next thing that I need for you? Woo. Is it any wonder that at the end of that the Lord was furious with them? That his fire broke out, fire of judgment broke out over the house of Jacob. That his wrath was raised against the nation of Israel because they didn't trust in him or his deliverance. Now I've got to say that was not a, uh, a unique situation. David there is reflecting on what the children of Israel did during their exodus from slavery into the promised land. And there were times at that moment there were people there saying it'd be better if we go back to Israel, to Egypt and suffer in slavery. Yes, you bought us out, but it's better if we go back in. You may remember that Jesus had problems with disciples showing little faith. And he chastised them gently for it. There was a time when he told the disciples they had little faith, but at the same time was commending a Roman centurion for great faith and the, um, the Canaanite woman for having great faith. They were not disciples. They weren't even Jews. And in the middle of that, he was reprimanding his own followers because their faith was little. So it wasn't the first time and it wasn't the last time and I imagine that during the course of our lives we are also guilty sometimes of being those disciples with little faith even though we've seen God do remarkable and miraculous things in the past. There are warnings here to protect us from being myopic and making us Godopic seeing him. They sinned and they rebelled against God while he was providing for them those rivers that were promised. They willfully tested him. They spoke against him, ungratefully saying, in effect, Lord, is that the best you can do? Really? Really? Who'd have that audacity? Who'd have that audacity to say to God, is that the best that you can do? And yet sometimes, as with the children of Israel, and as with the disciples of Jesus, that's sometimes what we do. In their rebellion and disbelief, they proved that even with the evidence of God's miraculous power before them, they didn't trust God. Isn't that sad? And I don't know about you, but I would be inclined to think, well, if I was there, I would have been different. I would have been saying, the Lord has done this and it is great in our eyes. And I would have been blessing the Lord at all times without the slightest bit of doubt in my experience. But would I? Based on the evidence of my own life, I've got to say that that idea is rather fanciful. And I may have been tempted to say, Lord, is this the best you can do? What an indictment that would be. If you saw the presence of God in miraculous power, if you saw him doing great and marvellous things, if you'd already seen him defeat the Egyptian army, if you'd seen him provide the manna, if you'd seen him make, make sure that, that everything was there for you, nobody starved on that journey, nobody went without, nobody's clothes wore out, everybody was provided for in that exodus from Egypt to the promised land and yet sometimes they were sitting there saying, Lord is this the best that you can do? We want quail. We want meat. And as I say, I sometimes chastise myself because I think I may well be 
guilty of that too. The lesson to us is this, it's don't overlook and don't underappreciate the present rivers of God in our lives. Look at what God is doing for you now and bless him for that. Look at what God is doing now and in faith receive the, the, the miracles and the blessings that he is giving and expect him to be able to build on that if it is his will to do so. Accept the present blessings of God in your life. Accept his present provision in our rocky places, in our wildernesses, in our pains or our seemingly uncertain futures which is surely the basis of how the children of Israel were were doubting him, they did not know what was coming next, even as we seek him for those futures which he has got lined up for us. God's provision for the children of Israel was ongoing. It didn't stop at the Red Sea, it didn't stop at Sinai, it carried on until they approached the, the, the banks of the River Jordan, excuse me, under Joshua's leadership, it carried on after the River Jordan. It was after the River Jordan that Jericho was torn down. It was after the River Jordan, after they'd been through everything else, that God had another miracle lined up for them. His protection and his, uh, his willingness to give them the Promised Land unopposed by tearing down Jordan, uh, Jericho over the River Jordan because God's promises never ever stop. I wonder if the people who were guilty of doubting God's ability to provide meat when he'd already provided manna, I wonder how they would have felt if they got to the promised land and realised that Jericho was theirs for the taking because of the power of God. And that's how it is for us. Isaiah goes on to mention more of the promises of God. And this again is wonderful. I like the fact that it is covered by Moses writing Deuteronomy. It's covered by David writing Psalm 78. And it's covered by Isaiah, actually in various places in his book. For I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessings on your descendants. They will spring up like grass in a meadow, like poplar trees, by flowing streams. How lovely is that? How magnificent is that? How future looking is that for the blessing of God in Isaiah's time? I will pour out water on thirsty land and streams on dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring, which he did at Pentecost and beyond, and my blessings on your descendants. They will spring up like grass in a meadow, like poplar trees by flowing streams. Because the promises of God are not just for today, sometimes they are into the future, and sometimes we just have to believe that God is going to do those great things in the future because of what he has done for us now. No more saying, we know that you've done that Lord, but we very much doubt you're going to do anything better than that. This is Isaiah pointing forward, as Isaiah's prophecies often did, to a time beyond the Old Testament, to a time when the, the, the blessings of God will be poured out onto Gentiles. We spoke about that a little bit last week when James was quoting from Amos, Amos chapter 9, and, and we know that that is the case because we have been the recipients of the blessings that Isaiah spoke about here. And if God can produce blessings that Isaiah spoke about here two and a half thousand more years ago, surely we can carry with faith the idea that God is always going to provide for us, that he's always going to bring us to the point of blessing ourselves because he has promised that he will do. God gave them natural water because they needed it, as I do. More importantly for them and for us, he poured out on them spiritual water because they needed that, because we needed that too. He poured out his spirit and his blessing on his people. And, and it's an absolute remarkable feat that he did exactly that. As we read in Psalms there, 
that he poured out he was going to pour out his spirit on us and on you and by the way if you check out Psalm 78 you'll realize that the word spirit there comes with a capital letter whenever the the word spirit comes with a capital letter in the scripture it is talking about the Holy Spirit it's the person of the spirit which is why it's given that capital letter there as a name of the spirit not just a an idea of a spirit or a generality where is that going to be poured out where is the blessing of God most obviously when it's poured out and that is on the dry and thirsty ground the experiences that we sometimes go through in life maybe you're going through those now maybe your spiritual life is dry and and, and you're thirsty I think as a church we are somewhat dry and thirsty we need more people in our church for certain but we don't just need people in our church to, to fill the grey chairs that we have. I've got a thing about our empty grey chairs. Um, but we need people in our church to, to, to put layer upon layer of the, the spirit and the blessedness of the church. Nobody should ever go to church just to be blessed. Everybody should come to church to be a blessing and be blessed. And take on the mantle of those who give from God as well as those who receive from God. So if you're in that position, maybe you're watching a video, but if you are not an attender at our church and you live in Eastleigh, you need to get yourself here. You do. Because we want to be a blessing to you. And we want you to bless us. We want this church, and I'm sure it's going to happen in 2024, to break away from the old blessings and move into a new season of blessing. A new promised land for us as a fellowship but I believe that's right for individual believers as well if you are going through a bit of a rocky patch if you are going through a dry time in your life you need the blessing of God to be poured out on you you may have experienced the blessing of God in the past uh, and maybe you have been guilty of saying well that's all right you've done it in the past Lord I doubt you can do it again let's say to God in faith Lord we know you can do it again we know you can bless our lives we know you can take us into a flourishing place a place where the, the, the streams of water break out from that, dr that dry and thirsty land. And let's receive that blessing in utter faith from him. I've got just one more set of scriptures to bring to you in just a moment. But I just want you to think about this. We, we sometimes regret the tough times and we dislike them I can't help but reflect back on the 9th I think it was or 8th of September last year was it 8th or 9th Ellie's wedding sorry 9th right of September last year my daughter got married here in this church oddly to her husband Ollie and it was a great day Alan took the service for us and married those two it was the perfect day and absolutely nothing went wrong during the whole of the, the wedding. But it was also the hottest day of 2023, which was already a hot year. And we were crammed into this church, uh, which has got very little in the way of ventilation for such an occasion. And it was absolutely stifling in here. and It was very uncomfortable. We had bottles of water being given out to people. I'm not entirely sure how nobody fainted it was so hot. Uh, all the fellas sitting there with their suits and jackets on and the ladies looking resplendent in whatever the ladies look resplendent in absolutely great but it was baking that's when we needed the water of those little bottles that we had the most because it was the driest because it was the hottest and we, we need the blessing of God most when the situation is the toughest when times are the hardest we need that situation of, we need God to break into those situations and, and absolutely he does we are the thirstiest when the weather is hottest or when we are working the hardest and we need that blessing at that moment in time we need more from God all the time because sometimes we are going through hard times hot times hard work times and I've absolutely no doubt at all that when we thirst for the rivers of God the outcome from him will always be the rivers of blessing that we need. The problem is, do we thirst for it? 
Do we ask for it? Do we plead with God so that we can put ourselves in the right place of blessing? You will remember back from our reading in Deuteronomy that it talks about the Lord chastising those who are disobedient. And then it goes on to say that by obedience we can we bring ourselves into the right place with God. By seeking God we bring ourselves into the right place with him. And that blessing will flow. When we thirst for the rivers of God the outcome will always be blessing. Speaking of the poor and needy, the parched who thirst for God will be filled by him. It is utterly his promise. I'm going to leave you with these scriptures here again from Isaiah but I think this is great. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. Just want to translate that because Christ is the firstborn amongst us who are believers in him and therefore God our God is also Christ our Lord. You remember again last week we talked about James saying he was a servant of God and a servant of Christ. So I'm moving this verse if you like, these verses from Isaiah into the New Testament era and I'm claiming them for us. I, the God of Israel, the God of the church, will not forsake them. I will make rivers flow on barren heights and springs within the valleys. I will turn the desert into pools of water and the parched ground into springs. If you are in a parched place at the moment, if you are in a hard and rocky place spiritually at the moment and you are pleading with God to bring about refreshment, please don't expect God to make it a bit damp. God never made anything a bit damp. When he promised the children of Israel rivers of living water, rivers of living water came. When he promised floods of blessing, floods of blessing came. He never made anywhere slightly damp. He always brings us floods of blessing. Now if we choose to look at that as damp, that's our problem. If we choose to look at the circumstances around us and say, Lord, well, it's only, it's only a foot of water, I need six foot. We need to have a word with ourselves because God's generosity to us is more than we deserve. It's exactly what he wants to give us because of his love for us even in the state that we are. Seek the Lord in the parched land of your own lives. Maybe the parched land of the church maybe the parched land of the nation as we see it at the moment and let's give ourselves to God so that he can change that parchedness to floodness I don't think those are either those, either those two are words but I don't care let's change see God change the parchedness of our land our church our lives and make them into the flooded plains in the land and the church and our lives I don't want to be amongst those people who look at God and say couldn't you do more than this I want to be amongst those people who say yay Lord you've poured out your blessing on us and what was parched then is now flooded in him but we have to thirst we have to seek after him let's pray Heavenly Father, we thank you because we can come to your presence. And maybe we are already in a, a flooded place, in which case, Lord, flood us more. Maybe we are in the middle of blessing from you, and we are rejoicing in that. Lord, give us more blessing and help us to rejoice even more in the gracious outpouring of your generosity to us. But maybe we are in that parched place. Maybe we are in that wilderness. Maybe we are at that rocky cleft. And we need your blessing. 
Father, I pray firstly that you'll help us to thirst for it. I pray secondly that you'll help us to see that cloud the size of a man's hand that is bringing blessing to us. And I pray then that we will be able to swim in the waters of blessing that you give to us because it's never ever going to be just a damp cloth. It's always going to be a swimming pool of blessing that you bring into our experience. And we love you for that, Lord God, our generous God. We will receive your generosity, Lord. We will ask for your generosity. We will give ourselves to you generously in return. Lord, as we seek you to do great things in this season of blessing that we have in front of us, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. Praise his name. Let's sing of our relationship with God and our belief in him. Let's affirm our belief. Not like the doubting Israelites there. Let's affirm our belief in God with this fantastic song that brings our experience to bear.
So go forth from this place and swim and swim in the blessing of God. If Monday is parched, pray for rivers of living water. If Tuesday is difficult, expect God to flood the place. If the rest of the week seems impossible, allow God to be your provider in every aspect of what you do. Amen.